Welcome to this week's engineering announcements from the IBA. NICAM Digital Stereo. Bruce Randall talks to Graham Sordi, the IBA's Head of Telecom's Development, about some of the problems we've experienced with its introduction. On the radio front, there's a site move for 2CR's VHF transmitter and new incremental stations for Belfast and Bristol. In transmitter news, there's a summary of this week's special announcements affecting existing stations and 20 years of IBA pocket guides, the latest and last one eagerly awaited by everyone and his dog. But first, Bruce Randall talks to Graham Sawley about the realities of NICAM. Graham, it's, it's about a year now since we first started uh, transmitting tests on NICAM. Um, yeah. I think it's fair to say now that we're in service, that there have been a few uh, hiccups along the way, a few uh, teething troubles, wouldn't you say? Now, is that really something we could have anticipated and did we rush into it maybe before we were quite ready? Well the six months of tests I would agree with you there were some teething troubles as you put it they were after all test transmissions and we were using a completely new transmission system and we were not only broadcasting NICAM we were networking the signals in digital form from the studio centres that was really the purpose of the test transmissions to iron out all the, pro the uh, problems and allow our equipment developers to get the equipment working perfectly. What caused the, the clicks and pops and mutes that we've been having? Well, in the early days we actually were not running with a complete system. We had only prototype equipment and parts of the system were not even actually in place. Uh, this is why we got clicks when we had digital errors on the transmission links. Now we have equipment that stops that. The BBC have been doing experimental NICAM from Crystal Palace for a number of years now. Why don't they have these kind of problems? Well, I can't really speak for the BBC, but I think what they've been doing is simply to have a NICAM encoder at the transmitter fed with an analogue signal. Um, in contrast, as I said, we've been taking a digital signal all the way from the studio right through to the viewer's home in a rather more elaborate system, really a forerunner of what we intend to use around the network. I do believe that in their final system, when they're networking countrywide, the BBC are going to use something very akin to what we've been doing. Now we're using uh, a dual channel sound and sync system to get uh, signals from studio to studio and from studio to transmitter. Now how have you managed to get uh, twice the amount of data uh, compared to the old mono sound and sync days? Well, as you say, mono sound and sync has been around for some years, since the late 60s. And in stereo, we have a data burst in the sync period but instead of it being binary data, we have four level data so that each symbol conveys two bits of information and thereby virtually doubling the data capacity and allowing us to carry two channels of digital audio. Doubling the error rate potentially? Possibly. Well, it, certainly you're putting more information into the same system so the potentiality for errors is greater. But However, electronics has moved on in 20 years and there's much more sophisticated techniques can be used to avoid that. Now you've, you've got a complete system here on the bench. Um, it's an awful lot of kit to be installed, but uh, what, what actual uh, units go in, in which location? Well, these units are the SIS encoders. Uh, actually, each unit consists of a NICAM 728 encoder together with a bit of circuitry which puts the 728 kilobit serial data into burst, mm -hmm. bursts of data in the vision sync pulses. That's the way the signal leaves the studio and gets carried around the network to the transmitting stations. Now here we have the equipment that's used at the transmitter. This is the sound and sync's decoder which extracts the data from the sync pulses and converts it back to 728 kilobits serial data. That data is then decoded by LSI chips, much the same as are used in a domestic TV, to feed the sound to the FM transmitters. But the s digital signal is also fed to this unit here, which is a QPSK modulator, which provides the 6.552 megahertz QPSK modulated subcarrier, which is added to the transmission. That's the actual signal which carries the digital audio to the home? That's correct. It, it, once it 
it has to be up converted to the final frequency and power amplified but basically yes that's the signal up here we have a changeover unit which is basically to control the we have duplicate systems of sys decoder and modulators so that faults can be coped with and repairs made without putting the service off the air and this unit monitors the units and performs the changeovers so there is quite a bit of equipment to go into each main station but uh, wouldn't it have been better if we tried to have a, a big bang launch for the whole country at one in one go well we could have uh, launched as you say a, a big bang at the end of the year in fact this was our original plan we would have launched the service at the end of this year to 75 percent of the population but there were quite a lot of NICAM receivers coming onto the market and there was quite a demand from Bremer to actually have some signals broadcast. So in the end we agreed to launch our service on an area by area basis as each ITV contractor became ready to transmit. A lot of people ask why there can't be a stereo mono indicator mode for NICAM. After all the, the receivers do tend to label or have displays on screen about stereo and mono. Well. Uh, it is true to say that there is there are four modes of the NICAM system that's stereo, dual language, mono plus data and all data and we can operate in any of those modes however most of the programming is mono or stereo and we don't want to do unnecessary switching after all mono is really a, a subset of stereo with stereo with no uh, different signal so we much prefer to stay in the stereo mode more normally and just go to the other modes should we actually want to transmit dual mono or mono plus data it's, it's true to say that there haven't actually been all that many programs transmitted in stereo uh, is there a technical reason for that or is it just something which will gradually build up as the year moves on oh undoubtedly um, obviously program makers have a very large stock of existing material all of which is in mono. Um, also, it takes time to commission new material. There was, at the early stages, some fear over the additional cost of stereo, but I think experience has shown, Channel 4 have said that the additional cost is well under half of a percent, so that's not really a major factor. But with the broadcasting bill and the possibility of auctioning franchises, obviously ITV companies have been very nervous about spending any extra money in that scenario so this has perhaps delayed the production of as many stereo programs as we'd have liked to see. Graham, all very enlightening, thanks very much indeed. Thank you Bruce. Bruce Randall talking to the IBA's Mr NICAM, Graham Sordi. And last Friday the Wenvo transmitter in South Wales, together with all its 72 relays, started radiating NICAM signals on a test basis on ITV and S4C. The tests, which initially will be only in mono, will consist of normal program sound, but they may have to be interrupted occasionally for engineering purposes until the full NICAM stereo service begins at the end of April. Normal mono FM sound won't be affected. Due to start NICAM tests in a month or so, Mendip in the West Country and Winter Hill in Lancashire. Both of these stations are due in official NICAM service on the 25th of May. And for those who are getting NICAM, don't forget that engineering announcements is in glorious stereo every week. Indispensable for keeping track of NICAM, RDS, news stations and a plethora of other transmitter information is the 1990 Pocket Guide to Transmitting Stations, which is published this week. It will, of course, be the last in a long line of IBA Pocket Guides which have evolved from this simple eight-page folded card dating from 1970. The guide took on its more familiar shape within a couple of years, the number of pages growing with new services and features until this latest edition of over 60 pages. Inside you'll find all the usual television information with a new clearer presentation and there's a lot of detail in the radio section with information about split programming and the new community style stations. It's all systems go for UK DBS as the movie channel set the BSB ball rolling for cable viewers on Sunday evening. And today we start a three-part series on the Mac system by looking at the vision part of the satellite transmission format. In transmitter news, a community radio update and details of two new television relays, Penryu Kaiba near Mountain Ash in Mid Glamorgan and Long Compton near Stratford-upon-Avon. The advent of high-power direct broadcasting by satellite enables most viewers to use dishes around 40 centimetres in diameter, or the equivalent square aerial. 
The five BSB channels use a new transmission system called DMAC. This is one of a family of standards recommended for DBS by the European Broadcasting Union. Much of the development work on the vision format, which is common to all the Mac variants, was carried out by IBA engineers here in Winchester. So why the need for a new system? Why not continue to use PAL? The present colour television systems were designed many years ago. When colour started, it was essential that millions of viewers with black and white sets should continue to be able to use them, receiving the colour transmissions in monochrome. The European Channel Plan for both VHF and UHF had been agreed some years before colour was contemplated, so the new colour transmissions had to fit within the same overall bandwidth already occupied by the monochrome signals. The answer? A frequency sharing scheme. A colour subcarrier placed at the high frequency end of the luminance signal. But there is a side effect for viewers watching in colour. The receiver's decoder can't distinguish between fine luminance detail and genuine colour information. The result, spurious patterning known as cross-colour. There's also another effect. The colour subcarrier produces a moving pattern on areas of highly saturated colour. This pattern of crawling dots is particularly visible on coloured edges. Once the colour and luminance are mixed together, it's extremely difficult to separate them again completely. Domestic PAL decoders simply have a notch in the luminance path to reduce the dot crawl caused by the colour subcarrier. And the simple bandpass filter in the chroma path lets through high frequency luminance information. Another less obvious disadvantage is that PAL is inefficient. Much of the time is spent carrying sync pulses and blanking periods. Only about three quarters of the signal carries actual picture information. There's another reason for avoiding PAL on satellites. The transmissions use frequency modulation rather than amplitude modulation as for terrestrial PAL. This is done to minimize power consumption on the satellite. With AM, the received noise level is constant across the received bandwidth. But in FM systems, the noise increases linearly in proportion to the frequency of the modulating signal. This doesn't matter too much for luminance, since the eye is less sensitive to high frequency noise. But with the PAL color signal carried on a 4.43 MHz subcarrier, the result is that all areas of saturated color are more susceptible to noise. So while PAL and CCAM can work well, they're not ideal for FM, and they are not readily adaptable for future developments. MAC stands for Multiplexed Analog Components. It does away with the colour subcarrier and so completely avoids the problem of cross-colour and cross-luminance. Also gone are the conventional sync pulses, making room for extra sound and data channels. MAC keeps to the 625 line format, but using time sharing, each line of separate colour difference and luminance information is, in effect, squeezed, so that during each transmitted line, there's room to put first the colour difference, then the luminance. And this is what it looks like, in its compressed and undecoded form. We've added conventional sync pulses for this demonstration, otherwise you wouldn't see a locked picture. You won't see any colour here, it's just a monochrome representation of what the vision part of the MAC signal looks like before it's decoded. On the right hand side of the screen you can see the luminance signal. It's squashed to two thirds of its normal width, from 52 microseconds down to about 35. To preserve all the detail in the picture, the transmission bandwidth has to be increased. The highest baseband vision frequency is about 5.6 MHz. In PAL it's 5.5. With two-thirds time compression, the bandwidth must be increased by 3 to 2, or 50 percent, up to 8.4 MHz. Of course, here we're seeing the signal in conventional PAL, which limits the bandwidth to 5.5 MHz, or much worse on a domestic video recorder. That's why you can't see all the resolution gratings on the test card. On the satellite, it all fits comfortably into the 27 MHz wide FM channel. The picture on the left represents the compressed colour signal. This has alternate lines of the colour difference signals U and V. 
Each line is compressed to a third of its original 52 microseconds, down to about 17 and a half. The maximum baseband bandwidth available for color difference is 2.8 megahertz, rather better than the 1.3 megahertz of PAL. The MAC decoder uses digital circuitry to expand the picture to its correct shape, and the output is in RGB components. The result is a much cleaner, sharper picture than is possible with PAL. But to make the most of the improved picture quality, it's best to use a Perry television or SCART connector to feed the television set. Some BSB receivers are expected to have S connectors, giving better quality pictures on some video recorders. If your TV hasn't got a Perry television socket, the satellite receiver offers a UHF output in PAL, but there's still an improvement in color, signal to noise ratio, compared to transmission in PAL. Mac also offers another first for British television. Films on BSB's movie channel are in widescreen format with an aspect ratio of 16 to 9 compared to the conventional squarer 4 to 3 shape. The first widescreen TVs are likely to appear towards the end of this year, but there's no compatibility problem with existing sets. BSB Mac decoders include the necessary expansion circuitry to produce correctly proportioned 4 to 3 pictures from the 16 to 9 source. More on widescreen and higher definition systems in the third of these installments on the Mac system. We'll be looking at sound, data and conditional access in the second part in a couple of weeks. Hello, I'm Andy Birchall and I'm the Managing Director of the Movie Channel. And that was how the very first official BSB transmissions sent the Movie Channel well and truly on its way for about 250,000 cable viewers on Sunday evening. The other four channels are being launched on successive evenings this week. For direct reception on individual receivers, the start date is the 29th of April. More on that nearer the time. We've previously shown how Mac pictures are completely free from cross-colour, doing away with the spurious colour patterning often seen with PAL. For DBS, the vision signal, consisting of lines of the time-compressed colour difference and luminance, is analogue in nature and transmitted using frequency modulation. The sound is digital. During intervals between picture lines, in place of conventional sync pulses, we transmit bursts of digits. But this carries more than just the sound. It's a multi-purpose stream of data. It provides synchronization for the picture and also enables the broadcaster to switch individual receivers on or off, an arrangement known as conditional access. Two European variants of the Mac format are in use from satellites today, DMAC and D2MAC. There's no difference in the pictures, but D2MAC has only half the data capacity. Here in the UK, the five DBS channels from BSB use DMAC. So let's see how it works and what it can do. The data signal is present for only about 10 microseconds during each 64 microsecond line period ahead of the picture signal. Each burst of data is broadcast at a rate of 20.25 megabits per second that's about three times the rate of teletext pulses. This gives 206 bits of data on each line. An exception is line 625. This is made up entirely of digital data, 1296 bits instead of 206. The receiver can use the data signal to generate its own 20.25 MHz clock signal. This is useful as a timing reference for expanding the time compressed pictures to recreate an RGB signal. The Mac decoder uses digital techniques to expand color difference by a factor of 3 to 1 and luminance by 3 to 2. Meanwhile, the data signal provides picture synchronization and digital sound. Let's take a look at the data format in a little more detail, starting with picture synchronization. We're looking here at the 206 bits of data that precede each line of the time-compressed picture. 
Following a run-in bit, the next six bits are used for picture line sync in place of the conventional pulse. The pattern of these synchronization bits alternates between lines. Near the end of the frame, each is repeated, and this tells the receiver when the next frame is about to start. There's also another way of achieving sync. Line number 625, made up entirely of digital data, starts with a pattern of 96 bits. These can be identified by the receiver as frame sync, and the decoder can then generate its own line sync pulses. Following the synchronization bits, 623 of the 625 lines each contain 198 bits of digital data. Each complete 625 line picture frame carries more than 120,000 bits, and these are divided up into 164 packets of 751 bits each. Individual packets may be assigned to various services, such as sound or data channels. In total, there are 4,100 packets per second. This is equivalent to a data rate of around 3 megabits per second and can be used for many different purposes. The keynote is flexibility. Each individual packet contains an address to identify which service it belongs to. For example, the receiver's decoder can pick out all the packets for a particular sound channel and then decode the digital signal to audio. There are many possible uses. A single high-quality mono sound channel with an audio bandwidth of 15 kilohertz needs just over 500 packets per second. Four stereo sound channels would take up to 4,012 packets per second, leaving some 88 packets per second to carry other data. The data packets aren't restricted to just carrying the sound. They can be used for business data and they also have another very important use, encryption. Sometimes referred to as conditional access, it means that BSB can use part of the data capacity to send messages to individual receivers and control descrambling of the picture. For example, if you haven't paid your subscription for the movie channel instead of the film, you might get a message telling you which number to ring to subscribe. Every individual BSB receiver has its own identity built in and BSB are able to control very accurately and quickly which receivers are allowed to decode the programs. Sometime in the future, it could even be possible to use the system for pay-per-view, perhaps for special events. All the circuitry for this is built into the BSB receiver. You won't need an extra decoder. All very complicated? Perhaps. But at least the Mac packet system is a European standard and is eventually expected to be used by all countries for DBS. So Mac is more than just an improved quality television format with multiple digital sound channels. It could carry a mixture of television sound, radio and data services. And it can even provide widescreen pictures and higher definition. More about that in a few weeks. <laughs> Hello and welcome for the last time to engineering announcements from the IBA. Remember how it used to be? Good morning. Time for another edition of the IBA's engineering announcements for the radio and television trade. Today we look back at 20 years and almost a thousand editions of these broadcasts and how they've evolved from humble beginnings. Also today a roundup of transmitter news to bring you up to date on aerial maintenance, NICAM stereo, community radio and new television relays. But we start with reminiscences of 20 years of engineering announcements and to help us we've invited back two characters who are mainstays of the program for so long, Pat Hawker and John Lovell. They're talking in the control room to Bruce Randall. Well, gentlemen, it's marvellous to have you back here again, looking younger than ever, if I may say so. Uh, Pat, you, you were in, in this programme at the very beginning, back in 1970. 
Uh, I mean, what was the what was the motivation for, for, for getting a show like this on, on the air, and, well, and how did it all start? Well, we didn't even call it a program because, in fact, it was really a series of announcements, and it started because of a terrible um, calamity we had on building up the relays for the colour program. Um, the whole of the uh, relay program was based on a certain type of 200 watt transposer, which they were supposed to run four four of these things in parallel to give us the higher power local relays. And too late, they discovered you couldn't run travelling wave tubes in parallel. So the whole programme got slightly delayed while we went and bought some um, valve-type um, equipment. And um, to cover the fact that the dealers didn't know where they were, we introduced this idea of making announcements on a Monday morning when the network was together for a programme that was called um, Monday's Newcomers, an old advertising system. It must have been very simply made in those days with very limited facilities, I should think. Well, we didn't have any facilities, really. We borrowed a certain amount of equipment from the E&D department, which had a, one slide scanner. Um, Peter King made us a, a caption scanner, and um, we just used to do the recordings in audio. And then we would have to insert visuals uh, alternately. It would want to be a caption and then a photograph on, on the slide. And of course, we didn't have any facilities for making captions, so we just stuck bits of um, magnetic uh, letters onto um, steel plates and so on, coloured them up with a cox box, as it was called. Well, by the time I came along in 1980 or so, uh, John, it was all in full swing with you marshalling 10 or 12 people to put the whole thing together. That's right, we had pre-recorded the sounds in the morning and then in the afternoon it was a question of getting the team up here, uh, at least one person for each piece of equipment, two caption scanners to deal with, plus a slide scanner, occasionally a camera and the captions that went in front of that. And of course the problem with that situation is that if one person makes a mistake, we have to stop and start again. Um, it was a bit fingernail biting, especially near the end of the afternoon when we still hadn't got it all on tape. Well, imagine. Uh, you were the, the voice of the IBA for many years. Uh, we didn't often see you in vision. Why, why, uh, why was that not done? Many people say, why don't we see the presenters every week? Well, we were aiming at a factual programme for the trade to give them information. It was not a personality thing at all. Um, time was of the other essence and of course facilities if you have a camera crew on the presenters it's going to take much longer none of us was trained to appear on television uh, it was quite sufficient just to get people with reasonable voices to pass the information on although we do have a few clips from uh, early days when we did try it once or twice including you I think just watch this for a second if you're a regular viewer then you'll know that the IBA has been working on a new system to give you one step more than the realism you get from stereo. It's called surround sound, and it's a system to allow you to hear not only sounds from in front of you, as in stereo, but from all around. Capital Radio are to make the first three-channel surround sound broadcasts in the London area. The IBA's plans are revealed for the engineering side of the fourth channel. Colour set deliveries are down, black and white sets are up, the latest delivery figures from Bremer. And a new leaflet available, all about our electronically generated test pattern, which we're already using in some ITV areas. Good morning, thanks for joining us. If you'd like a copy of that leaflet, make sure you have a pen and paper to hand in a few minutes' time, when we'll be giving you the address to write to. Transmitter news now, and this week we have four stations to detail. In Yorkshire, the Armitage Bridge Relay in the Home Valley entered programme service last Friday. Pat, uh, anyone who works in broadcasting has got a whole catalogue of hair-raising stories of things that uh, went wrong or almost went wrong. What do you remember back from those early days? Well, we used to do it all, of course, in, um, in Brompton Road in London. And um, one day when we were, Peter Ashforth and myself were we, um, making the sound recording, um, for the, what we used to call dealer mail, which was the first time we introduced the idea of unscripted interviews onto the program. Um, we had, uh, we were suddenly interrupted by the tea lady coming in and plonking down. <laughs> so that slightly threw us off balance, but uh, we were able to continue. John, what about you? Well, I think this is connected with Pat's story because on one fabulous day at Brompton Road, by that time we had one graphic artist, but he was late in that morning. And, um, all the captions we required were carefully locked away in his office. 
which was on the sixth floor, we were making the program in the basement, so there was a procession of people, none of whom could be spared, going up and down in the lifts, trying to break into his office. Uh, the story had a happy ending. He did turn up two minutes before the program went on air, and the captions arrived in time, just. But it makes the adrenaline flow. I remember one uh, dreadful um, time for me when I was interviewing a chap in the British Telecom Tower about how the system works there, a lovely chap. Um, but he gave me one-word answers, the interviewer's nightmare. Just how many different circuits does the control room have to deal with? 200, 250. As many as that? Yes. And uh, presumably you've got BBC and IBA circuits to worry about and other, other users too. Many other users, yes. But presumably the I ITV network keeps you busy most. That's the one, because the one that does all the switching. And does all the changing every half hour or so? Sometimes, yes. And so how do you cope with that? Do you have a, a big panel over there which looks as though it might do the trick? Yeah, that's the uh, switching machine. And you, you program that with the changes at various times? Yes, all day, all evening. Another horror story I remember is uh, when we were sitting here one morning playing out the programme one Tuesday and we actually discovered soon after the opening music that it was the previous week's programme we were showing again. And uh, Wayne Kilby was the engineer, he, he has done lots of things on this programme, but he was the engineer that morning and fortunately he had the right programme on the backup machine and he very cleverly uh, cross-faded and hardly anyone noticed. Uh, but Wayne himself of course uh, had directed the, and appeared in the programme himself uh, years earlier. You did press the record button, did you? Oh. What's the record button? What are these little damp patches where I laid my hands? <laughs> And, and memories of you, Pat, I seem to have to stand on a box when I'm interviewing you because uh, you're so tall. And I remember one occasion on Brighton Beach, one uh, international the broadcasting the dimension, we were doing something on the beach, and there I was standing on this box and uh, an yes, audience uh, gathering on the foreshore having a tremendous laugh at my expense. Yes, and I, I seem to be leaning over yeah, as though I'm protecting myself from the wind, and I suspect it was partly to try and come down to your level. <laughs> Um, yes, it was that one. But of course, the, the, in the beginning, we, we scripted all our announcements, and it wasn't until um, Peter Ashforth arrived on the scene that we actually ventured into doing unscripted interviews. And they were genuinely unscripted interviews. Um, and Peter, after he left engineering information and went into the program side, was quite prepared to be fairly critical of the engineering and make quite sure that mm. we did explain what was, what was going on. But let's take one of these. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the, the home terminal, for example. Nobody could surely argue that this is not a, a brilliant idea and is going to be extremely useful. Why all this soul-searching about whether it's really going to be worth it and so on and so forth? Well, how many of us uh, in our homes want to have a computer uh, available? Or how many of us would, in fact, look upon a home as a refuge from automation? I think those, um, it enabled lots of topics to be introduced in an informal way and I think that allowed us really to move on and develop it when the technology allowed us to, to introduce this kind of thing in vision and then we went in mm -hmm. to do more uh, elaborate features. With yes, when, you, when you've got a budget to, to actually be able to borrow a camera and do pieces, yes. this, this made a big change. The mast is rotated to maximise an intended incoming signal feed and measurements made of field strength of vision and sound carriers on all channels available from the parent station. The electronics are housed in a secure waterproof cabinet with good access for the maintenance contractor. On top the equalizers and main amplifier and down below the block converter to change the channels and power supply converters to produce 240 volts from the 55 volts AC fed up from the nearest house. Of course, anyone within range of the transmitter can benefit from the signals, whether they've contributed to the cost or not, so it's important to canvass local opinion at an early stage. Spare a thought for those whose job it is to climb the mast and work in very awkward and uncomfortable conditions. It's time-consuming work. Even changing a mast light takes quite a time. Many of the masts are 900 or 1,000 feet high, and you need a very good head indeed for heights. Standing on top of the aerial cylinder is definitely not recommended for the faint-hearted. Ακούτε τον ελληνικό κυπριακό ραδιοφωνικό σταθμό του Λονδίνου στη συχνότητα 103,3 FM. Φίλοι μου, τραγουδάει για εσά ο Γιάννη Πάριο να το πάρει στο κορίτσι. Η μουσική είναι του Ζάκ Ιακοβίδη και η στίχη του Κώστα Νικολαίδη. Απολαύστε το. 
A comprehensive range of alarm indications are built into the monitoring system to alert the operators who can remotely control the uplink equipment by overriding the automatic commands of the station controller. The off-air sound and picture quality is also monitored at Croydon, using similar receiving equipment to that available to the average domestic viewer. Well, we've all had a, a wonderful time doing it, but uh, as we say, all things have got to come to an end, and the show must go on at least for another few minutes. So uh, we'll hand back to Janet Salkeld in the studio for the special announcements. And thank you very much, Bruce. And the first of the last special announcements is for Winter Hill in Lancashire, which continues on reduced power during a major aerial overhaul. In Suffolk, Anglia ITV and Channel 4 from Sudbury are liable to be off the air between 5 and 11 a.m. any day up to the 16th of August and on continuous reduced power throughout this period. This is for replacement work on the aerial system. The Beacon Hill transmitter near Torquay is continuing on reduced power into August on all four channels during major aerial work. A very quick roundup of other transmitter news. For incremental radio, tests have started on 102.6 MHz from Allsley Park for Radio Harmony in Coventry. Programs, mainly for ethnic groups, are due at the end of August. NICAM stereo for television is now spreading rapidly. In addition to the six main stations already in service, another five are due very soon. Belmont, Carradon Hill, Divis, Rowridge and Sandy Heath. There should be a further six stations with NICAM by the end of the year. Television relays and on Tayside, Kin Ross, delayed a little, is now due later this week. Group CD aerials for this one vertically polarised. In Devon, Great Torrington is also delayed and it's now expected towards the end of next week. Group B aerials again vertically polarised. Engineering information will of course continue for the time being on Teletext. We can't go without just mentioning Paul Gardner, who for ten years wrote and produced so many of the more in-depth technical features in these broadcasts and generally kept things afloat during the 1980s. We know from the many letters you've sent recently just how much the programmes have been appreciated. Thanks for all your good wishes. Well, all we can say now is thank you for being such a loyal audience and as a reward, next week at this time, there'll be a special programme looking forward to the transition of IBA Engineering into a commercial transmission company. So remember to set your VCRs for one more week. But from all those who have worked on engineering announcements over 20 years, thank you for watching and goodbye. Radio communication has transformed our world in just a few decades. For most people, it is hard to imagine life without television and radio, or instant communication. The business world would be crippled without computer links, facsimile machines and car phones. Developments surge ahead, and many of them would depend for their existence on the telecommunications and broadcasting infrastructures. In July 1989, the Home Secretary announced the government's intentions to privatise, on a national basis, the broadcasting transmission networks, owned and operated by the BBC and IBA. This national basis is vital for the economic and reliable operation of the networks. BBC arrangements will remain static until its charter expires in 1996, but the independent sector will move ahead and take advantage of developing markets. The new Broadcasting Act, for the first time, opens the way for broadcast transmission to be run on a truly commercial basis and, built on the firm foundations of the IBA, a new transmission company is emerging to meet the challenge. Transcom will take on the vital role of delivering ITV and Channel 4 television to the population of Britain 
at a cost of less than one pound per head per year. This will be the core business, but with transmission sites throughout the UK, the possibilities are endless for associated non-core business. From its headquarters, situated near Winchester, the company will coordinate its operations, maintenance, planning, installation, research and development, and other support services. The quiet setting disguises a bustling business and engineering centre, which pours together the far-flung resources of a truly national company. It's here that much of the groundwork is done in support of transmitting operations all around Britain. Broadcasting services are taken for granted by the general public, and what greater compliment can there be to such a massive and complex transmission system? It's not for the viewer to think about the perils of mast and aerial maintenance or the discomfort of working in cramped conditions a thousand feet above the ground. It's not the viewer's problem when nature strikes both halves of a transmitting aerial in the depths of winter, but there are men who are trained and prepared to tackle the situation straight away. At times like this, the backup of a national transmission company and all its resources suddenly proves to be of vital significance to millions of people. In the summer months, most viewers are unaware of preventative measures being taken at high-power main transmitters. Although the transmitting aerial panels have a backup facility, the loss of a panel due to a sudden fault can be very awkward, hence the preventative maintenance, as this IBA aerial engineer explains. One of the biggest problems when you lose a panel is that not only are they a thousand foot off the ground, they're tucked into the white cylinder at the top of the mast. Um, we're limited in the number of men that can actually get in there to take a panel out. They have to be fairly slim built. Um, I am at the point of really struggling and always trying to find somebody that's a lot smaller to get in there. So it takes time. Um, we've then got to bring that panel to the ground. We've got to repair the thing and get it back up. Um, but the transmitting aerial panels are only the tip of the iceberg. Down on the ground, the plain-looking buildings concealed another highly specialised operation, the transmitters themselves, which produce high-power radio frequency signals containing the vision and sound information. It's a mysterious world, combining complex electronics, control systems, cooling, power engineering and computers. With stations situated on remote hilltops, a maintenance team may need to drive 30 miles in a blizzard and then apply great skill and concentration to a situation which could affect a fair slice of the population. The many disciplines demand highly trained engineers of special versatility. All the transmitters operate unattended and the whole system is monitored and controlled from only four regional operation centres and overnight from just one. Engineers there can identify problems, switch in backup equipment and keep an overall eye on the performance of the system. With a regional network of maintenance bases, problems are dealt with promptly and efficiently. With many of the original ITV transmitters approaching 20 years of age, the IBA initiated a major program of re-engineering of the installations. This work will continue so as to guarantee a high level of service and optimise running cost. The challenge is to replace completely the transmitting installation without the viewer even noticing. This is being achieved by means of transportable temporary transmitters which are moved from site to site as necessary. Thanks to progress in technology, the new equipment takes up only half of the space occupied by the old installation and that gives enough flexibility to maintain transmissions at virtually full power throughout the work. Usefully, it also makes room for equipment for a fifth channel. Re-engineering has also provided the opportunity of adding LICAM digital stereo sound to UHF television. This is an attractive added feature, bringing sound quality similar to compact disc to television programs. Transcom will continue with both re-engineering and NICAM installations, carrying on the work of the IBA started. With these and any other major projects in the field, the planning, system design, testing and technical support skills at the Crawley Court headquarters contribute a great deal to the smooth running demanded on site. 
With such a strategically placed network of prime transmission sites, there has always been a demand from non-broadcast users to lease space on masts and make use of other facilities on offer. This demand has mushroomed in recent years with the arrival of many more radio-based telecommunication services. No one wants a proliferation of masts and towers throughout the countryside and site sharing is the obvious environmental and economic answer. More business opportunities present themselves in the world of data communications. The ability of a television network to deliver a data signal to almost every property in the land gives unparalleled point-to-multipoint distribution. With the satellite data market being opened up, data broadcasting is set to enter a new era. Satellite broadcasting itself has already demanded new techniques and skills of the engineers involved. The uplink station for the UK's high power satellite service was designed and commissioned by the IBA's engineering division and the experience gained in this new field has great commercial potential. Similarly, research and development work in broadcasting and related fields is always highly valued. Whether it be specialised equipment for the transmitter networks, representing UK interest on international committees, or developing new broadcast systems, in these laboratories can be found many of the answers to the questions of the future. The engineers who work here have the ability to develop solutions to accommodate any future system which may be required for the expansion of UK broadcasting. The specialist skills and depth of knowledge possessed by these broadcasting technologists must be nurtured and preserved with a commitment to long-term funding and continuity for staff and projects. This kind of expertise cannot easily be found elsewhere. Over the years, the IBA's experimental and development labs have contributed greatly to the technical excellence of broadcasting in the UK. But they have also had a significant impact on the broadcasting community worldwide. It's in everyone's interest that this capability is recognised and supported in the future. Given the necessary backing, many aspects of research and development can continue to flourish under a commercial banner, with customers both at home and abroad. Never before have there been so many diverse opportunities and new markets for broadcasters to address. The careful use of that scarce commodity, the radio frequency spectrum, is a subject which has always needed a careful mix of both academic and practical skills. The complexities of the frequency planning for terrestrial television have been thoroughly reworked to find ways of providing a fifth channel for most of the country. Our propagation engineers have been looking at local microwave television systems, MVDS. A field trial in Winchester produced valuable information to assess the possibility of MVDS services across the country. National and international representation is absolutely essential on frequency planning matters and technical standards. Expertise in this field is rare and is in great demand for consultancy work. At the beginning of the 90s, it's clear that telecommunications and broadcasting can no longer be kept apart. Indeed, they are rapidly converging. Whatever the future holds for these new partners, Transcom will be there with resources and experience built on 35 years of commercial broadcasting.